morning we are privileged once again to welcome Mr. Charlie Harari to achieve our Torah. Highway, and when you pass the highway, there's a huge book about him sign. 
So as the car keeps telling me the story, as the car passes the highway, the car's about to see the sign, the car makes a right turn, and now like it goes down the little cobblestone street. And he's like, oh no, this is like where I end up on Al Qaeda or something, like I don't know what happens next. And he's like, the car's like bumbling along the street. He's like, I don't even know these guys. How did I end up in this car? They're gonna kill me, they're gonna come And he goes to the end of the street. The end of the, of the, of the whole cobblestone road is a tiny little like like little like a cafe. And sitting in that cafe have two like Israeli looking guys, like I don't know, like, eating like olives and hummus, speaking like a million miles an hour, like, Yoni, that been that for the little and, he's, and he gets out, he's like, what's going on? He's got four guys. And, like, and he's like that, and he goes, uh, my name's one of guys, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's sitting around, and he's just talking to you guys. He's like, okay, I'm sorry, I don't know what is going on here, but I am really scared. So he, they say, we're, we're with the Mossad, and we're about to open up an intelligence division in China. And you guys, you are the first, we were sitting and talking to you, and we, found, we found out about you when you were here, they were talking to you. You said that you knew Chinese, you speak Chinese, you're blonde, you're blue-eyed, you're American. Perfect. We want to know if you want to come and join the Mossad. So that comes back to America. So he goes, Michal, what should I do? I'm like, what should you do? I'm like, does it get cooler than that? Like, that's how spy movies start. You know what I'm talking about? You can be like a lawyer now, like do contracts when the Mossad says we need you to join us. He's like, you're right. He goes up to his boss, he's like, I'm, I quit. And he gets on a plane, I'm like, okay, good luck. Yeah, I get to go. He gets on a plane, he goes, he flies to Israel, and he joins this whole thing. And I don't speak to him for like five years. Five years later, he gets a leave of absence, he comes back to America, and we go out to dinner, and I'm like, tell me everything. So he's sitting over at a, at a restaurant in New York, and he tells me the whole, whole story. So I want to share with you one little piece of this story. He says when he got there, apparently it's not like what I thought it was. That's what the Mossad is like. If you could like run on a treadmill and watch a couple of army movies like you're in, apparently it's not like that at all. It's like a real army, but like you're running and doing, it's like crazy. Because when he got there, he almost like quit like 10 times. But he got to the next level, and he got to the next level, and he got to the next level. And finally, finally, he got to the last possible level he had to get to. And all he had to do was pass this last test, and he would be considered an officer that is a high enough rank to be part of this intelligence. So he's a great soldier. He's doing okay. He's wonderful. And the way it works, that the last test was you have to read coordinates. Right? When, he, when a hostage is in a desert, the way it works in hostages, if you pick up a hostage, it's not like you can go to like some Arab town and be like, hi, where are you holding this? Okay, make a left in the corner, you know what I'm saying? There's a shawarma on the right if you're hungry. You want to catch me from Arab on the left? Yeah, just knock on the Esra Ahmed, it's down in the basement. That's not how it works, you know what I'm saying? Like, all we know, that like he's in some location somewhere, and like you have to like read on a map like where he is. So the way this last test was that you have to like learn how to read these like maps. So they put you in the middle of the desert, they tell you you gotta get to the hostage in the middle of like some house somewhere within five minutes. So he goes, okay, he knows that dude, he's taking, he's taking a class, he knows that dude stuff. So he gets in his car, he gets his Jeep, he's got his team, he gets his thing to go, okay, five minutes, he reads his things, he reads, he goes, I know exactly what he said, let's go. They're, they're going, we're heading due north, due north. They're going north, he has five minutes, he's doing great, like four minutes left, he's doing great, like three, two, one minute left, he sees the action from the distance to the house, he's like, this is a piece of cake, I'm totally gonna pass this. As the car goes 40 seconds left, all of a sudden he hears, pop! He spins around, his back right tire blows out. He goes, oh my God, you didn't fix the tire. He's yelling at his guy, you didn't fix the tire. He goes, I didn't know it was, how did you not fix the tire? He goes, get out of the car, get out of the car. He yells at his guys, he guys jump out of the car, they're trying to fix the tire. He goes, I got 10 seconds left. Like, he's like, you guys are incompetent. He jumps out, he goes, forget you guys. So he's warning himself, he's 10 seconds late, he's 20 seconds late. He sees the house and he's like, I can't believe this happened to me. 30 seconds late, he reaches the door, he's 40 seconds late. As he reaches the door, he touches the knob and it's locked. And there's a sign underneath that says, you fail. It's like, you're kidding me. Oh, five years. Five years. This is my last test. This tire blows out. Puts his head down. He just walks himself back to his Jeep. He gets in his Jeep. He drives back to his barracks. And as he gets in his barracks, his commander, his mentor comes in and goes, listen, it happens. Relax. It happens. It's not your fault. We know we're watching the whole thing. The tire blows out. This, this happens. Shake it off. Step up, brush it off. Tomorrow morning, you get another chance. It'll be fine. You know this stuff. So he goes, okay, no problem. He goes to bed, wakes up in the morning, by the a.m. Commander knocks on his door, gets dressed, goes right back in. He has a new quarter. He's got the same team, same team. He, everyone checks the tires. They spin it a few times to make sure it's okay. Everyone's okay. Everyone's a little tense. He goes, let's go. Gets the new coordinates. He reads it. He goes, I know exactly what this is. Ten minutes. And he's going. Eight minutes, he's fine. Seven minutes, he's fine. Five minutes, he's fine. The way it worked, and the second thing he told me was, you couldn't get there by your Jeep. You had to park your Jeep, and you had to run around this massive sand dune to find the house. 
parts the jeep, he's got two minutes left, he got his team, they put on their gear, and they start running around, and as they start running around the bed, around the bed he hears, ow, 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 he turns around and goes, what? He goes, I, I think I broke my ankle. He's like, you didn't break your ankle, are you crazy? He goes, I think I broke my ankle. He's like, pick him up, carry him, get the charge. He goes, you guys, I can't believe I'm working with you people. He's yelling at him, he goes, let's go, let's go. He goes, hobble, hobble. He's like, I can't move, I can't move. He goes, forget you guys. He drops his team again, and he goes bolting for the house. He's like, I can't believe seven, you two times in a row. And he's 10 seconds late, and he's 20, and he's 40 seconds and now he's a minute late, and he comes running up to the door, and the door's locked again. He says, you failed. Now he's just, yesterday he was upset, and he said he was sad, now he's just angry. He goes, so he told me he went back to his barracks and he ripped the place to shreds. He turns up to God and goes, really, God? I'm, this is what you do to me? He goes, you know what? It's not your fault. You know what it is? It's the Israelis. They hate me. They're trying to fail me. I know it is. They don't want an American to pass. I know this is a setup. They probably had some meeting somewhere where they, oh, 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 I hate these people. I hate this. He's breathing. He said he was breathing fire. 20 minutes, his commander walks in and says, listen, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I mean, like, listen, we're superstitious a little bit. Like, you know, this has never happened in the history of the army. Two, I mean, we know that it wasn't you. Two times, I, I, we're meeting about you at six. I'll let you know what happens. Comes back, six o'clock, he's just pacing his room. He's just, anything he sees, he's punching. He's ready to leave in. Eight o'clock, his commander comes in and goes, listen, we just had a big meeting about you. You're American, right? He goes, yeah. he goes, you Americans, you like baseball, right? He said, yeah. He goes, okay, you do baseball. Three strikes and then you're out. He's like, I don't know what that even means. <laughs> so he says, we had this meeting about you, and apparently I used every chip I ever had. I begged them, I cleaned it with them. I said, give me one more chance. Three strikes and you're out. Tomorrow is your last chance. If you fail tomorrow, I don't care if lightning strikes you. I don't care if God himself jumps in the way. If you don't hit that door at the right time tomorrow morning, tomorrow, you hitchhike to a cab stand, you take a cab to Ben Gurion, there'll be a plane ticket waiting for you, you go home, it's over. And he goes, fine. <laughs> the guy walks around. He knows it's set up. He knows he's getting, he knows tomorrow is just a set up. He goes to bed that night, he's so upset, and he lays down and he goes, wow, five years. This is it, my last night in Israel. I've been for five years, and this is my last night. And he lays back, and he remembers the first flight when he first, he first asked him. He's like, wow, that was crazy. Like, I can't believe I even bought this in the first place. Like, I get some random call to go to Israel, and I got on a plane, and I landed. And I remember when they turned the corner, and I thought they were going to kill me, because I thought they were Al-Qaeda or something. And they're going off the thing, and I remember that. The home was the king of the young. Oh, my God, I remember that. It's so, it feels like it was yesterday. It was five years. And then something hits him. Let's wait a second. He goes, Dad, wait. The first meeting with those guys. There was a guy there that I had, wait, wait, wait. There was one guy that everyone was like kissing up to. He was, I remember that guy. I had never seen him again. I already told me something that really got me excited about the army. He said something, what did he say? What did he say? Yes, he said that what it means to be an Israeli soldier means no matter what goes on, you protect your men in the end. Meaning, we're doing tough things in life, you always take care of your men first. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Because I hadn't seen that guy, wait a second, wait a second. It was three years ago when I got my my next level, and they said, congratulations, congratulations. Because to me, they said, congratulations, they said my name. And I was like, how do you know your name? And I saw that guy in the distance. I said, wait, that guy gave a class. That's right, I went to his class. It was two years ago. It was after I graduated that level, and the whole class was about when you're in intelligence, you're gonna be in tough situations. When everything goes wrong, the first thing you do is take, you take care of your own men. You gotta worry about your men, we're one family. I said, wait a second. We donated the rec center. The guys who were elite soldiers, they were complaining about getting sabotaged. I said, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. They're not testing me about whether I get to the door on time. They're, not, they're testing me as to when I'm about to hit the door and everything goes down, do I take care of my own men or not? They're not trying to fail me. They're trying to pass me. I'm just taking the wrong test. I think it's getting to the door. It's not. It's when everything goes bad right before I get to the door, whether or not I'm a leader and I take care of my guys, or I scream and yell at them and run for the door. I'm taking the wrong test. 
He goes, I got that at 2 o'clock in the morning. He goes, he goes, you got that, he said. I got up, so I put up my uniform, and I waited at the door. 5 a.m., the guy's like, whoa, whoa, you okay? <laughs> he goes, he goes, ready. He goes, okay, two Jeeps. He goes, whatever. New coordinates. He goes, I got it. He sits down, they give him the thing, he puts it down, reads it, he goes, I know where this is, let's go. They go, two Jeeps, we're going. Five minutes, he's fine. Four minutes, he's clear. Three minutes, he's fine, he's waiting. Two minutes, one minute, and he's flying. All of a sudden, he can feel it, he knows it's gonna happen. 40 seconds left, there's a call that comes out of the radio. There's been a problem, they're shooting at the other Jeep, they're shooting at the other Jeep, and he can feel like that frustration, and he just pushes it right down. And as opposed to getting upset, he goes, I got it totally. He spins the car around, covers the back end, takes care of his guys. He's one, he's two, he makes sure everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be, he's perfect. He takes care of his boys. He's five seconds late, he doesn't care, he's 10 seconds late. Everybody's okay, everybody's safe. He puts everybody in one Jeep, and he heads to the house, and he's 30 seconds late, and he's 40 seconds late, but he doesn't care. He took care of his guys, he did what he thought was right. As he hits the, to the house, he's a minute late, and as he goes in, he reaches at the door and he figures that door is going to be locked and as he reaches the door it's unlocked. The door opens up and sitting there in an empty room with his commander smiling. And if this is America they'd be like, congratulations! Like balloons would come down. We're going to have a graduation party and a second graduation party with your grandma. Let's take a picture. Capping down, coming this way. Let's take two pictures. Where's the iPhones? They're Israelis. Like, but said that go do something important. why we don't really love this time for The reason why we don't love this time, if I, if I remember what I was like, is because each and every one of us come into this time, you know how we feel? God doesn't know. You think God cares about me? Really? You know who he cares about? There's like four or five rabbis that have all, they're on the walls. He loves those guys. <laughs> there are people that I see, when I go to shul, there's the guy sitting in front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so when he dobbins to God on your kipper, God's like, hi, oh, yeah, oh, I think there's some chatter behind you. Can you get, can you give me that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So anyways, Rabbi, what were you saying again? We come to this period of time, and all we have during this period of time is God telling us, I want to hear from you. And you know how we feel? No, you really don't. I'm such a nobody. I'm so young. I don't even know this stuff. I don't even know what I'm saying. I don't know the words. I don't know if I'm into this. I don't even know if I care about this. God, you for sure don't care what I have to say. The problem with all of us is that we never have the moment that he had that night. We never have the moment in, in, in our room where we look up and go, what is going on here? You see, all of us were born into this. We were never, we never felt chosen for this. We wake up one day and we show up and all of a sudden we're in the school and they tell us, by the way, oh, you're Jewish? Welcome to the team. Here's like 4,000 Hebrew words you have to say this year. We never were ever part of the picking. I remember when I was in high school, I'm teaching with Flatbush. I'll never forget ninth grade. When we, I tried to ask the men, I didn't make it. I'll never forget that day. I came in the next day to school and there was a, a list of whoever made it on the board. It's, it's, I don't know why they did these things. They literally put the team right when you walked in. I walked in that first day. I was like, maybe I made it. Maybe I made it. My whole life was basketball. Maybe I made it. I'm like, huh, okay. Maybe it's both Rari with a Z. I don't know. Maybe. Um, maybe it's both the Rari. Maybe they're Israeli. I don't know. Oh, oh, maybe not. I was like devastated. The next day, next year, when I made it in 10th grade, I'll never forget. I came in that day. And I looked at my name slowly, I'm like, not A, not B, not C. Oh, Harari, Kama Charles. I'm like, oh. the security guard's like, oh my god, I'm gonna throw up. I'm like, can you picture me with the sign? <laughs> you know what it feels like to be picked? The reason why we don't feel that way is because we sit in this room and we think that we're, being, we're running this test and that test, God wants this from us, with that from us, and we're never enough. We never make it enough. We never say it with enough kavana. We never feel like we're good enough. And we never have the moment where we sit down in bed and we look up and go, wait a second. He's not trying to fail me. This isn't something that I can't do. He's trying to pass me. They picked me. When God created the world, and everybody is wonderful, and everyone's awesome, but you can imagine, and if you're a Jew, you have to believe and understand that while the world is great, B'ni B'chor Yisrael means there's something special that God says is about us. We're like his kids. And we weren't there. And if, when, all the, when, when all the souls are in Shemayim, and a baby's about to be born in some Jewish family, and ever you can imagine when God goes, who wants to be part of the Jewish people? Six billion souls, every hand goes up. Be God's child, the creator of humanity's child. Every hand goes up. And 
And he goes, no, 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 yeah, the back. Yeah. You guys are wonderful. You, 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 the one that's on fire. You're, 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 you're the daughter. Yeah, 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 no. Yeah. We never, we weren't there for the picking. So we never feel our like picked. We don't fully, in our hearts, we don't believe that the creator of humanity, I'm talking about the creator of the universe, the creator of the universe, for some reason that I don't know why, pick little, young, moon, just me, I don't know why, the man, the one who created the sun, the moon, the stars, thought that Charlie should be part of his nation. Why? What a, I don't know. We don't feel this way because we don't feel, we don't feel picked. We never sit in the room at night, one night, look up at the stars and go, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Wait a second. This isn't about how many words I can say as quickly as possible. The creator of the world wants to hear my voice. Why? Why does he care about me? I remember one time, I'll say one more story. I remember one time I was with my son. God bless my son. He's five years old. We were driving over to New Jersey. Not a place I like going too much. We were driving over to New Jersey. And we passed, we crossed over the GW Bridge. GW, GW Bridge is English for a traffic bridge. So we passed over the, the GW Bridge. And as we crossed over the bridge, I'll never forget, my, my son looks, I tell my kids every time I cross over the bridge, kids look outside the window, look up at me, flush, I'm afraid of the world. Well, my kids not like God knows what he's doing, you know? So my kid was, must have been five. So we pass over the bridge, and I go, Moshe, look how beautiful I'm afraid of the world. And my son was just learning how to dive, he just got his first sitter. So he goes, Daddy, you know what's so funny? In Shiva, they gave me a sitter, and in the sitter it says Baruch Hashem. I'm supposed to talk to this guy named Hashem. That guy and that guy have the same name. <laughs> I'm like, honey, it's the same guy. It's not even a guy. He's like, no, 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 Dad, you don't know what to talk about. You're not my rabbi. You don't know what you're saying. You're not in Shiva with me. You don't know. In my Shiva, you weren't there. In my Shiva, they gave me a sitter, and in the sitter there was a guy named Hashem who we who apparently prayed him. He's like her father and stuff. That guy, he's got the same name as the guy who created all of that. I said, Han, I'm not your Rebbe. However, I do know. He's the same guy. <laughs> now, there his little five-year-old brain is like, wait, 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 that, and that, and I'm like, uh-huh. He's <laughs> like, that is Awesome! It's like, can I borrow your phone to call all my friends? Can you imagine that you'll have Jews go through this period of time? You'll have Jews go through this period of time, and they'll never once take a step back and go, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. The creator of all of that cares about me. You know what we don't do? You know what you should do? What I do every Yom Kippur? I'm going to give you a suggestion. On the way to shul every Yom Kippur, on the way, I look up and I go, I can't believe that the one who created all of that cares about me. Does he know that I'm nobody? And when we believe that he's not trying to fail us, this isn't about a couple of rabbis only. Rabbis are holy, but this isn't just about them. When he believes that he's not trying to fail us, he's trying to pass us. We're just taking the wrong test. We think the test is saying a million words. We think the test is getting through it and hoping to not be too bored. The test is not how many words we can say. The test is can we get to one moment on Yom Kippur where we feel picked, where we feel chosen, where we feel like, what do you see in me that I don't see in myself? Where we feel like our soul, the whole army is wondering about us. The whole army is trying to make us somebody special, when we get to that point where we can walk around the Yom Kippur and feel chosen, our name is on the list. You know what that's called in Hebrew? Chayim. That's life. True life is realizing that Hashem cares about me and loves me even though I don't know why. He still does. Your parents don't love you because of anything. Your parents love you because you're your children. God doesn't love you because of anything. He loves you because you're his kid. And when you have the moment sitting in the barracks, and you look around and you say, wait a second, I may be taking the wrong test. You come out the next morning and you're strong. You come out the next morning and you got it. 
you show up on your own kipper and go, wait a second, this isn't a test about saying a million words. This is a test about seeing if I can get to one moment during the day where I feel like he picked me. Yom Kippur is not about how much you believe in God. Yom Kippur is about, is about how much Hashem believes in us. And whether we get it or don't, or we're young or we're old, or understand what we're saying or not, when we feel that way, we're soldiers. I brought it to you that this year you feel like a soldier. This year you feel like a child. This year you stare up into the world and go, I can't believe he picked me. And when you have that excitement and that pride, when you walk around with pride, when you realize that your name is on that list, when you realize that you're children, when you realize that the creator of the world picked you, you feel a little different. You feel a little more excited. You get a little bit closer to him. And that's all he wants. Let me end with the following. I'll never forget for my kids, the best day of the year for me, besides my birthday, is Father's Day. Why? Because my little kids think that they make me, I love when they come up all like the scribble scrabble. There's nothing better than when, they, when you get scribble scrabble from your kids. You know why? Because when your five-year-old scribbles on a, some coloring thing and goes, here, Daddy, made it for you. And I'm like, oh, I love it. It's, it's scribble scrabble. He's like, no, it's you. I'm like, oh, OK. This looks a little bit like Daddy. Uh -huh, I have red things running around the paper. Oh, there's just an L? Oh, yeah, what about that? You know why I love it so much? It's so totally not amazing. You know why I love it so much? Because it's my kid. As long as my kid tries to tell me how much he loves me, I don't care if it looks great or it doesn't. We think Hashem wants us to say every word perfectly. Let me tell you what he needs and what he wants. It's Father's Day on Yom Kippur. He wants us to look up for one minute and go, you know, by the way, thank you for choosing me. I'm excited. I don't know. I just happy to be part of this nation. This is awesome. It's a scribble scrabble. I'm going to say a couple of words in English and Hebrew. Either way, Daddy, I love you. And thank you for making me part of your nation. If we do that on Yom Kippur, we feel chosen. We feel like soldiers. As you get older, you become stronger and stronger, bigger and bigger, brighter and brighter, until you become true soldiers in our army. May you come soon in our days. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day.